suffer the little children to come unto me. So we simply say, let them come. Sometimes the devil calls you to all the So mom and dad, I love you for being there for me. We'll all be together with Christ the devil. 
always ask that you do several things when you come to hear the word of the Lord. No matter who's teaching, no matter who's preaching, when God's word goes forth, the Bible has promised us that it will not return unto us void. And so we always ask that you come thirsty. When you come into God's house, you need to come thirsty. Then we also ask that you come expecting. Expect great things from God. And then we pray and ask that you take notes. It's always good to take notes. Holy Ghost talks to you throughout the service. And you need to make sure that you take notes. And then lastly, we ask that you pray. Not only that you pray uh, at the beginning of the sermon, but also throughout the sermon. Bow your heads with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to hear the word of the Lord. God, we pause for a moment and ask that you will quiet our spirits. We pray, God, that you will bring focus to our minds. I pray always, God, that nothing in my life will prohibit this word from going forth. And I pray the same for the hearer, that nothing in their life will keep this word from finding fertile soil into which the seed can be deposited and will bring manifestation, Heavenly Father, of the fruits we pray, God, for your Holy Spirit to come and speak today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elder. I appreciate it. Mother's Day. I'd like to give personal thanks to my wife for taking care of our children in my absence, and I am indebted to you for playing both roles as father and mother symbolically as a father, certainly a caring uh, mother. Amen. You have been, a lot of times people don't recognize that the, what you see up front and in the pulpit is not nearly as important as what goes on behind the curtain, behind the scene. And it takes a lot to, to, to run a church. And I'm so grateful that the Bible promises us uh, that upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. That's the promise of God. But it does not mean that Satan will not put up a good fight. And so when you see a good person, a good program, a good something going on, you, you need to know that a lot goes on behind the scenes. Um, our children, our, fir our first Sabbath, are youth Sabbath. And that's why you see our young people up. We're preparing them to be able to step up. Because Joel says, in the last days, my spirit shall fall upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And so we're teaching them, you understand, the mechanics of being prepared for the Holy Ghost to infill them so that they can prophesy and speak God's word. Uh, and so we thank you for your indulgence, for honoring our mothers today. Uh, we are so grateful that you are a part of our lives. We love you very much, and uh, we just, uh, we wouldn't be who we are without you. That is indeed a fact. We don't take you for granted, or at least we should not take you for granted. Well, of late, lately, I always stand in the pulpit with a with a heart 
to proclaim God's word. And I understand the severity, seriousness of the proclamation of his word. But of late, every time I've stood up to preach, maybe, maybe the last three Sabbaths, maybe a month, uh, there has been a sense of internal urgency in my heart. Uh, and, and so that, I guess if you were from the hood, you'd say put a little hot sauce on it. Uh, so it's been that kind of feeling over the last, the last three or four Sabbaths. Turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. Let me, let me, let me get down to business here. 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I want to read verses 1 through 15. I hope I have time to actually uh, get to the, the exhaustive, hermeneutical, exegetical um, exercise of this scripture. We have a meal prepared for you afterwards. Uh, please stay behind and, and, uh, and eat with us. We have some special things planned for you. Was there a, an announcement about the evening program or afternoon program? About the, the, the thing that somebody told me was going to be happening? Was there an announcement to that effect? No, so I, should I make the announcement? Should I not make the announcement? Is it still going on? Okay, okay. You know, sometimes they spring, they, they keep the past in suspense uh, so that I don't say too much and kill a secret. But I think that this afternoon or this evening at 6.30, uh, they are going to have a, uh, a pamper party. Uh, and, of course, this pamper party is not, as I mentioned before, uh, the pamper that you put on your baby. Uh, that's a huggy and a pamper. This is where they're going to massage our ladies, and they're going to give them some rubs and scrubs. And they got some of the men doing some of that uh, for our wives, which we ought to gladly be able to be guilty. I, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but, but at 630, we want all of the women or all of our mothers to come back, and they have prepared for you uh, a pamper party at 6.30. Is that all right? Amen. So come. They, I, I told you there won't be no, there won't be no, uh, for the sake of clarity, there won't be no getting naked and all that, so don't be worried about that. Man, they, you know, they're down at the porch, you know, massaging, and, you know, you know how the church is. You tell a story one way, and then it gets down the street, and they got us running around the church uh, like David. He pulled off all of his garments and was praising the Lord. Uh, so it won't be quite that, that Holy Ghost covered. But we want you to come back at 630. Uh, they put a lot of effort in, in making that happen. Second Samuel chapter 11 and verses 1 through 15. I'm reading from the New King James Version because it flows a bit better than the King James Version. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David set Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of, his, of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a man, we're reading scripture now, And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her and came and she came to him and he lay with her for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And 
Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said unto Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all of the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said unto Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said unto David, the ark of Israel and Judah are dwelling in the tents. My lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped out in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat, eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said unto Uriah, wait here today also and tomorrow and I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and he drank before him and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. 14, then in the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab, sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the front line of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. Now let me start out first of all by saying this about this sermon today. I am the least qualified to speak on Mother's Day. I am the least qualified because I am not a woman, because I am not a mother. I could never see things the way that a mother sees things. I can never feel things the way a mother feels things. I can never struggle like mothers struggle. So I cannot understand the challenges that they go to, through. And until a child breaks through the birth canal or a baby, a baby is pulled through a slashed incision in your belly, it is difficult for me to understand what motherhood is really all about. So I'm not really qualified to preach to you mothers on Mother's Day. But I will attempt to do my best to try to share a few thoughts of appreciation of what you have meant to me and what you mean to us. That I must be clear about. The story is told about a young man who had committed a crime way back when in a small village, a crime that was worthy of death. That young man went through the court of law and they found him guilty as charged. It was the custom of that time that you be hung until you die if you were committed to a crime. And so when the day of reckoning came, when the punitive part uh, of the sentence was to take place, all of the town gathered out around the hanging gallow to wait for this young man to be hung. When he was on the gallows, they read out his charges and they read the conviction and they were waiting for the bell of that town in the tower to ring. It was customary that the bell would ring in in, 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 in saying that it's time to die. If the bell did not ring, that meant that the king or the judge had reversed his sentence and therefore their life was spared and mercy was extended. So as they waited for the bell to ring, they placed a black cloth around his head and they tied it. 
His hands were behind his back and he was standing on the chute that was to be released. And when they gave the signal to ring the bell, the story is told that all they heard in the city tower were thumps and bumps. Not the bell ringing, but the sound of thumps and bumps. So they wondered what was going on. They saw the bell moving back and forth, at least the cord up, but there was no sound. They come to find out that his mother had climbed up the tower, that his mother had strapped herself to the bell. His mother had gone up so that she could buffer the sound of the ringing bell so that they could give him pardon and mercy. You couldn't ring it twice. You had to ring it one or two times, and after that, that was it. And they found her strapped to the bell, dead, because she stood in the place of the life of her son. I'm here to let you know this morning that if you want to know the epitome of sacrifice and service, if you want to know the epitome of commitment, look no further than that of the life of a woman. If you really want to know what love is all about, you need to look at the life of a mother. Motherhood cannot be dupli duplicated no matter what circumstances surrounds a pregnancy. No matter how you ended up with your child, whether or not you were irresponsible young people who were frolicking around and you got pregnant, whether or not you were someone who was not faithful to your marriage vows, and you either got somebody pregnant or you got pregnant. It does not really matter how you became a mother when it comes down to God. God is more concerned about the fact that you are a mother. And the moment you become one, there is a divine mandate and there is a divine deposited spirit that he puts into every mother that cannot be denied. Her mission is a divine commission. You are who you are because God has made you the way that you are. We cannot replicate that as men. That cannot be, be, be manufactured. Women have a special something. Mothers have a special something that comes out from their hearts that we as men cannot relate to. They set an example to their children that sets the course of the eternal destiny of their children. Mothers are the ones from the breast to the boardroom. Mothers are the ones who set and adjust the sails in terms of the direction of our children. Mothers are the ones who spend an enormous amount of time with those children. Mothers are the ones who can literally change or set the course of society and a country. Mothers can. All we as men, we go out and fight the wars. All we make the decisions to go to war. We do all of that, but mothers are the ones who are the ones who mold and fashion and shape the minds of our babies and the minds of our young people. And they can literally change the course of the world. Not so much when a child is an adult, but when a child is young, they're the ones that mold and and fashion that heart and that mind and that and those intentions. Now, folk, I'm not saying that men are not important, but I'm saying that mothers are the ones who sets and chart the course. If you remember in the Bible, in the book of John, chapter 2, the Bible says that Mary was at a wedding with her, with her son Jesus. And the Bible says that they ran out of wine. Not only did they run out of wine, but in those days, it was customary that you were embarrassed and you, you were just talked about all over town if you ran out of wine. That was a very important thing in those days. And if you recall, the mother came to Jesus and she said, son, they've run out of wine. A compassionate mother. Don't want anybody to be embarrassed. And she said, son, somebody, and Jesus said something interesting. He said, woman, my time is not yet. But still, even though he made that clear that this wasn't the place where he was supposed to start his ministry in terms of miracles, 
The mother turned around as though nothing was even said and said to the servants, do what he tells you to do. That meant that she understood that when she said something, that her son was going to do something about it. That's indicative of the bond. Now, y'all don't understand what I'm saying. Here was a man who said that, listen, my time is not yet. This is really not where I'm supposed to start doing miracles. The mama was kind of saying, well, you're going to do one today. My time is not yet. And she told them as though the servants, as though she knew that Jesus was going to do something. She said, do what he tells you to do. Then the Bible said that they got jugs and filled them, and these were six water pots that were 20 to 30 gallons each, which meant that it was one, somewhere between 120, 130, and 180 gallons of wine. The Bible says that the, that, the, that the chief person or the master of this ceremony said that the wine was so good that he had to call the bridegroom and say, who made this wine? And you don't hear anything else about Jesus because Jesus don't like to take credit. So he probably left and went after that. But they were looking around and wondering, who made this stuff? Where would you buy it from? What store did you get it from? The Bible said that the man said, this is good stuff. Good wine. Jesus not only made it for his mama, he made more than enough. Made it taste better than any wine anybody had ever tasted. Why? Because his mama asked him. His mama asked him. God is serious about this mama thing. God is serious about this mama thing. Y'all stay with me now. Stay with me. We're going we to get. God is serious about this mama thing. In fact, he is so serious about it until in Matthew 18, 1 through 6. I won't read it all, but the Bible says, but whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe, it'll be better for him to put a millstone around his neck and cast himself into the depths of the sea. God has said, I'm so concerned about this parenting thing, this mama thing, until that if you, ch if you, if you, if you become an, a, an obstacle or a blockage in the front of a kid, you are worthy of death. Now, we know he's talking about mature believers here, but he used the example of a little child in order to make his point. Why? Because mama -ing is important to Jesus. Mothers ought to be esteemed highly. Mothers ought to be honored. The Bible even goes so far to say that you ought to honor your father and your mother that your days might be prolonged on the land that the Lord thy God has given thee. A lot of kids don't understand that the reason that they're going to early graves is because they have violated this command that God says, honor your father and your mother. If you want your days to be prolonged, if you want your life to be elongated, you need to make sure that you honor them. Now, the Bible does say mother and father, but I got a feeling that God's got a special anger for those who come against the mamas and don't honor the mamas. And there's a reason why I believe that. You know, it's something about mamas when you uh, find a, 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 a sports person who makes a basket or a goal or, 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 or a touchdown he don't say nothing about daddy. Always sends a shout out to my mama. When they ask him the question, who was the most influential person in your life? These guys don't sit down and say that it was my daddy. Most times they say that it was my, my mama. It's something about, do you know that there are a lot of people in jail? Not because they killed somebody or hurt somebody, for disrespecting their father. There are thousands of people in jail today. Y'all ain't hearing me. Y'all ain't hearing me. There are thousands of people in jail today because somebody disrespected their mama. Somebody put their hands on their mama. I never ran into anybody that says I'm in here because I shot somebody who disrespected my daddy. But I've run into people who said I'm in here because somebody, whether it was his daddy or his stepdaddy, they disrespected my mama. And as a result of that, they were willing to kill for her. There's something about the bond of a woman. There's something about the bond of a mama that goes real deep. I mean, it goes real deep. 
I don't even try to get into, in, in, into the middle of a mama stuff. Once mama says something, I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm done. Because that's, that's, that's just, that's the word. That's the end of it. Whether she's right or wrong, that's the end of it. And so you, you, you read in the book Education, Ellen White, Ellen White says this, the, the word education means more than a course of study at college. Education begins with the infant in its mother's arms. Education begins when the child is even in your womb. They have found that you can pass on certain propensities in the heart and the mind and the makeup of your child when you're a woman. Y'all ain't feeling me here. If you're an alcoholic, your child is prone to alcoholism. If you are a drug addict, your child is prone and propensity to drugs. That's why children are born on crack when their mothers are crack addicts. And they literally got to shoot their children with heroin or drugs in order for that child to die, if not, if to live. If not, that child would die from withdrawal symptoms. So what chance do I have to come up against a mother who has literally, literally, literally placed and deposited her spirit into a child? And that's why mothers are so very important in our society. That's what child guidance says on page 26 uh, and page 27. And I know it's unfair. I know it's unfair to really put all of this burden on our moms. I really do. But the fact of the matter is that that's just the way it is. Mamas, you got a responsibility that is so deep and so heavy that I, I, really, I really applaud you and I, and I pray for you because you've got a, a, a job to do that nobody can replace. you got a job to do that really falls on your shoulders. And, 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 and I've learned now why the Bible says so much about widows and why the Bible says so much of, about mothers and, and, and single and the motherless and the fatherless. I understand that now. I, I thought about it when I was studying this message. And ladies and gentlemen, I understand why there's so many scriptures that talk about that. The reason is, is because we think of widows as old people. But in the Bible, most widows were women whose sons, women whose husbands, brothers and uncles and cousins were killed in war. So when you think about widows in the Bible, we normally think about old folk. But most of the widows in the Bible, because you'd go to war and 10,000, 20,000, 15,000, 100,000 men would die. And the old men were not allowed to go to war. It was the young men. So when you think about the Bible and widows, it was not old people. They were young women who still had children to raise because their husbands had gone out to battle. When you talk about widows, when you talk about the fatherless, that's who the Bible is talking about. And I've learned in my, in my study I've learned in my reflection why mothers are so important. Because when, 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 when a child is the victim of a relationship that has fallen uh, by the wayside, maybe divorce or maybe the, the couple didn't, didn't stay together, when a child is the victim of that and they fall through the cracks, if the mother is not where she ought to be with God, then that means that that child is now exposed to the enemy and he is a better candidate, an easier candidate, not for the kingdom, but for Satan's kingdom. See, when, when, when the children fall through the cracks, now you know they're, they're innocent, they're not, they're, they're not the victims. A child doesn't talk about how he came into the world, they just come. And they come into the world based on our decisions. Are you hearing me? And so when the husband and wife or when the boyfriend and girlfriend don't stay together, help me, Holy Ghost, 
Now the man is out the picture. The only thing that's left to guide that child into the kingdom is the mother. And I'm convinced that the devil has attacked motherhood these days because he knows, men, we've been walking out on women a long time. Okay, I got a little bit more rumble on that one. We, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been giving up on our task for a long time. A lot of us can't even find our baby daddy. There are a lot of them who don't know where they are and really don't care where they are. But that's all right. That, that happens. But if the devil attacks mama, that is the last line of defense. And it opens the door for the child not to be covered. And so I am convinced that the devil now attacks womanhood. He now attacks, you know, marriage. He now attacks motherhood in order to get his agenda accomplished. Okay, you didn't get that? Let me try it a different way. Daddies are out of the picture. Mama is the one who molds and shapes character for the kingdom of God. And if I can get rid of the dad, okay, there's a domino effect, but at least mama there is the last domino that's holding it up. So if I can get the mama to fall, okay, let me try it this way. Let me try it this way. If I can get the mama dedicating all of her time to trying to be ghetto fabulous, okay, that helped a little bit. I can see that. If I can get the mama to spend all of her resources on, on trying to stay forever young. If I can get the mama, y'all don't understand what I'm saying. Okay, okay, okay. To create a revolving door with men coming in and out of her house. Are you with me? So, so that the son or, or the daughters do not have an example to live by. If I can get the mama's character, she spends all the time with the children. She's the one that gave birth to them. She's the one that has the greatest influence over him or her. If I can get that mama. Now, you know what, you know what I struggled with with this sermon? When you put together a sermon today, you got to be careful how you say what you say. There was a time I used to just preach and I'd let it rip. Boom. My word, when I return it to me, boy, boy, and I'll give you a glass of water if the pill was too big, and I'll tell you to swallow it. Hope this helps you swallow the truth. But today, you got to be somewhat politically correct. And you got to consider what you say. And it gets to the point now to where you get into your sermon and you, you put the thought down and you say, no, maybe that's a bit too strong for them. And then you try it another way, and then, no, let me erase that because that might not be. Then you go, and, and, and you know, it, it, it's, it's unsettling to me. Not because I'm afraid the truth, I know the truth going to be preached, but how you say it. There is an attack on motherhood today. That's why I can get on the plane in Chicago. And I look around and I'm calling people, uh, excuse me, sir. And when they turn around, oh, okay, okay. That, that. That's why when I go to the mall and I mistakenly, my daughter was down in Key West with me and my wife. And she, you know, saw this person coming in behind her. And when my daughter went in, she said, excuse me, this is the women's bathroom. And the person said, I know. I know. And my daughter, oh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I, I'm so sorry. And then the girl started trying to hit on my daughter. Oh, you know, you got them beautiful, you got them pretty eyes. Can I get a witness, Miss Lewis? Then my daughter came out apologetic, and she says, oh, my God, I feel so silly. I feel so bad. Oh, Dad, what I did was I said it was, but she looked, she looked like a, I, what, 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 what should I have said? I, I, 
You know, I, I, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. See, now my daughter is in a quandary because she tried to stop somebody from coming into a bathroom and the person looked like me. Okay, y'all, y'all ain't with me today, y'all. See, see, I'm telling you, this is what I struggled with when I was down typing my sermon. Because you say, well, now, wait a minute, you know, why? Because a lot of us, a lot, first of all, because we're on the Internet. We're, we're, we're being around the world. We're being watched in Africa right now at 5 or 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the, in the evening. And all of us have members in our family. Okay, all right. See what I'm trying to say? You see my point? And then when you start talking about stuff, folks get all tight-jawed and cross their arms and what you trying to say. I'm only making a point that womenhood, I'm only making a point that that motherhood is under attack because the devil knows if I get rid of the man, the last uh, line of defense is the mama. And if I can break that barrier, I can do some damage in a society. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. If I, if I can get if I can get the shorts, I, I'm not here. I'm not here. I'm not here today. I'm not here today to beat down on women because I got something for you now. But I got to make a point. If I if I can do this, because the daddy ain't there, and sometimes the mother is just a presence there. And the enemy goes into our homes and, and, and he destroys them because he said, that last line of defense, if I can get that mama. And so you thought that the problems you were having in your home simply had to do with the fact that you can't get along. No, no. There's a whole nother agenda. Here's another thing that attacks our, 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 our motherhood. Uh, everybody now want to go to work. Everybody now want to be a professional. Everybody now wants to have a good job. And women feel deprived if they're not able to go out and make equal pay. Do the same thing you do. Oh, I'm for equal pay if you're doing the same thing I'm doing. Oh, amen, amen. But the fact of the matter is, is that folk are running out, out, out from under responsibility and leaving their children in the care of whoever and whomever, whenever, however. I told you motherhood is under attack. Now, don't, don't, hey, don't get me wrong. I got two daughters. One of them is 36 and one of them is 31. And they are very modern. But I got to tell you today that I'm old school. Oh, old school don't make it true now, but I'm old school. I'm 1957 is when I was born. I'm 59 years old in a couple of months. I came up through the 60s and the 70s. And I've lived long enough, thank you, Lord, to see the modernization of things. And I'm telling you, I can see the before and the after. And I'm telling you now that no, there's nothing, listen to me, listen to me. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get a job. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get a college degree. But here's what, here's what bothers me. When you do have a baby, if you do have a baby, guess who you want to raise the baby? Old school. You know what? That's all right. That's all right. You want to get your education. You want to get the, and, and, and aspirations are good. Don't, don't, hey, the Bible got women in the Bible who were exceptional. Don't get me wrong. But they knew what was required in order to make sure that Israel, y'all ain't hearing me. You see, a woman made sure she took care of the spiritual need of her family because she knew that through her the Messiah might come. She, she knew that the, that the Savior was promised through Israel. And so she was careful about how she handled herself. I need to make a clarification to tonight, today. Here's what I'm saying. Washing dishes 
is not the maternal instinct that I'm talking about. Washing clothes is not the maternal instinct that I'm talking about. Cooking food is not the maternal instinct that I'm telling you is God-given, divinely deposited. No, no, no. The best chefs in the world are not women. They are men. Those are learned attributes. But there's a difference between a daddy cooking and a mama cooking. No, you still don't. And it's not taste. It's not taste. There's something in them biscuits. When a mama makes them, that her maternal instinct to care for and to provide for her children. There's something in a mama. Are, are y'all ever seen National Geographic? When, when a predator tries to grab a mama's child or calf, she might lose the battle, but she's willing to give her life for that calf and for that calf. That, that, that's why the Bible says that the, about, about uh, what's that text in the Bible? That says that uh, uh, you may forget, a uh, mother may forget a suckling child, but God says, I will never forget you. The reason God quoted the text was to say, if you could ever imagine your mother giving up her child, that's unimaginable. And God says, if you look at that, it's like me. I, I, I am, I, I am, I am. Y'all with me this morning? I am more committed to you than a mother is in Kruger National Park in South Africa when a predator tries to go and get her child. She will fight to the death. And I'm saying to you that I will give my life for you. I'm saying for you that a mother may not, may not, may, but generally not, but I am so in love with you that if you could ever imagine, any woman in here willing to just throw their child away and give them up? You can't even imagine. I can't even imagine you doing it. My, mother, my wife would kill me. There's just something about that bond. That's God-given. And that's one of the reasons why I try to tell the women in the church, you ought to stop all, all of the chatter and the yipping and the yapping and, 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 and setting, at times, bad examples. Because as you go, I know it's not fair. I know it's not fair. But as you go, we will skip out on you in a heartbeat for a better set of legs than the ones you have. I know ain't nobody say amen on that, but that's okay. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. But a mama, she's left holding the bag. When they get a divorce, the judge, eight times out of ten, if not nine, it's getting a little better, will make sure that those children, if at all possible, are in the hands of the mama. Watch this. And if the children are given to the daddy, we wonder what's wrong with the mama. It's, it's natural. Well, why, why, why they gave the children to, to the daddy? Must be something wrong with the mama. But if it's the other way around, don't nobody say that about the mama who gets the child. What's wrong with the daddy? <laughs> Just give me a few more minutes here and, I, and I'm going to bring it home. Don't, don't nobody say that. And when you have somebody with four, five, six, or seven babies, we don't say nothing about the man or men. We say she got all them, she got, look, she got all them babies. She's the victim. And we talk about her and them and call them trash and less than and ghetto and, 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 and whatever other new word they got for them. That's what we call them. 
But guess what? To the mama with them four, five, or six children, she ain't thinking about that. You know what's on that mama's mind? I got some miles to feed. You know what's on that mama's mind? I got to get this done. You know what's on that mama's mind? Is that I thought we had a relationship. I had confidence in you. You let me down, but I got a job to do. Oh, let me get to my story here, and then I'm going to bring this sermon to a close. Let me get to my story. And this is the story about Bathsheba. And you know, you don't hear a lot of sermons about Bathsheba. You hear more sermons about David. And then she's thrown in the picture. But I started thinking a little bit about Bathsheba when I did my study. Because I said the Bible is clear that Bathsheba was the daughter of. The Bible is also clear that she was the husband of. Her husband's name was Uriah, not David. Follow me now. Follow me now. Just stay with me. If you're with me, just say amen. Her husband, she was the daughter of, the Bible says, and then she was the wife of. Now, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she's the mother of. And it ain't her husband. Why? Because one day the Bible said, David, with his smooth self, with his good-looking self, with, uh, anointed by God, able to, able to run a kingdom and, and manage stuff and things. A great warrior had a reputation of slaying giants. The Bible says he was out on the top of the roof and he looked over and he saw. Now, now, now remember now, Uriah was his bodyguard. Uriah was one of his chief officers. Uriah stayed close by because if anything goes up on going down in the palace, Uriah coming there with his sword and willing to give his life for whatever's going on up in here. Then when David saw her bathing on the rooftop, the Bible says that he beckoned her to come. He didn't ask her to come. He sent his servants there to say, bring her here. And while he said, who is that woman? And his servants said clearly in the Bible, she is Uriah's wife. That didn't bother him. He kept on doing what he was doing and allowed his lust to boil over inside of him. And the Bible says that he did something that he should not have done. Let me tell you all something. Let me tell you something. Can I give you all a little advice? If don't nobody respect this, male or female, When they say that they, look to me. Okay, let me tell you something. Can I help you out? There is an unwritten code of guys in prison, Elder, where when you get out, you don't mess with another guy's girl while he's in prison. You ought to know how it feels to be in prison and have somebody come after your wife or your girl. So it's a code of honor that's not uphill, but that you don't mess with somebody while their man is in prison. Why? Because you ought to know how it feels. If somebody does not respect this and continue to give me compliments and trying to get all up into my romance section, You don't respect my ring, you're not going to respect the ring if it's on his finger from you either. This. So when somebody starts talking about, I, 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 you're married, I know you're married. Excuse me, maybe you didn't hear what I was saying. Let me spell it out for you. M-A-R-R-I-A-G-E. If you don't respect that, you are dangerous person. So when the servant says, that's Uriah's wife, David went on like it wasn't nothing said. 
end up doing the, doing the whatever they call it today. Doing the do, doing the nasty, doing the whatever, whatever, kicking boots, whatever you call it. She ended up getting pregnant. David now calls. I'm bringing it to a close. Watch this now. David now calls the general, calls Uriah home. Uriah now says, all right, Captain, what you want? Then, then, then David now knows that, 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 that Bathsheba is pregnant. Now, Bathsheba didn't have a, 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 a choice. Why? If you refuse the king's request, you're going to get killed. I guess she could have made that choice. She could have. But the pressure on her. A lot of women do things just because there's pressure on them. Then Uriah comes home and he sleeps at the door of the king like a puppy. David said, go home. I want you to get involved with your wife so that you, you, ain't you going to get. No, uh-uh. As long as the ark of God is out in the field, as long as Joab is out in the field, as long as my men are out there eating bread and water, I'm not going to come home and sleep with my wife. I can't do it. That's integrity. That's a man for you. If he was that kind of husband, what kind of father would he have been? A great father. But David gets her pregnant. She's not a father. He's not a father of a child that's illegitimate. And he tries to cover up. And not only that, ladies and gentlemen, she's not only pregnant, but he puts her with his harem. You know how women can be. The other ladies that are in his stable, she's now in the stable and now is pregnant with the son of the king. They going to talk about you. They ain't going to treat you right. Because they going to say, I should have been the one that got pregnant by David. How dare you come up in here? But Bathsheba had it bad and she was talked about like a dog. Oh, but you go to Matthew. You find three women that are in the genealogy of Jesus. One of them is Rahab. That's a prostitute. That's a night walker, not a night stalker. That's a prostitute in the line of Jesus. And the other one that you find there is, is, is Bathsheba. Because she gives birth to Solomon who is a part of the lineage of Jesus. I'm telling you, the God that we serve is like, even though you had the child, out of unfavorable circumstances, I still got Solomon. Now, the first died, first child, first child died. But the second he married her, the second one was Solomon, Shalom. Peace. How could you ask for peace for a woman who slept with the king, how can you call him Solomon? I told you because God does not care how the child <laughs> comes into the world. He's only concerned with the fact that you've been given a divine mandate, ladies, to hold up the standards and to make sure that where we left off and fell off, that you catch those children in a basket and don't let them hit the ground. No, y'all ain't feeling me. Help me, Roger. Help me, Roger. No, don't do it. Stand your ground. Hang in there. The salvation of our children depend on you. And that's why our women are all out in the street fighting each other. Pulling each other's weeds out. That's why our women in the streets are under attack as it relates to their, 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 their lifestyle. Alternative. It's an attack. The devil knows if he can get you ladies. That's it. You know, I, I don't like to dog out men. And I'm not here to do that. But I'm saying men, we, we, we done messed up. 
we, we messing up. We messing up. And ladies, if you don't get it right, we done for. We finished. Oh, we can hurt you. We can hurt the real bad ladies. That's why God says, man, he, you see Jesus, how he responds to women in the Bible. Women caught in adultery, he says, neither do I condemn thee. Anybody hear me? Ladies, stand up for me. Stand up for me. What's that song you sang there? Wasn't that the song from uh, Surly Caesar? I remember mama. How did that song go? That's a nice song Shirley said. I remember mama. So many songs written about mama. Ain't too many written about daddy now. Whole lot of songs written about mama. Because you're all that. Because you're all that. And listen to me, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. When we, when we, when we, when we, when we as men make your, your, your task difficult. When we make your task unbearable. It's the ploy of the enemy sometimes to use us to make it hard for you. And then you begin to slack, and then you begin to give up, and then you begin to come, become vulnerable. It's a ploy of the enemy. I guarantee you, on the sea of glass, standing before the, before the judgment seat of God, it won't be because of what the preacher said from the pulpit that saved you and your children. Many times you, your child, will turn to the mama and say it's because my mama prayed for me. It's because my mama taught me. It's because my mama, my, my mama, my mama, my mama. Let me talk to those whose, whose, whose mothers are still alive, and I want to holler for you a minute. When my, when, my, when my mama died, my daughter's 31 years old. She was pregnant. My wife was, wife was pregnant with my youngest daughter, who's 31 now. 31 years ago when I lost my mama, cancer. There was a pain that I never thought I would ever, ever, ever get over. Never. When my daddy died, I'm not saying I didn't love my daddy, but there's a difference in mama pain and daddy pain. Here's what I'm going to tell you if your mama's still alive. While she's alive, you ought to soak it up. Oh, I'm going to end this, I'm going to end this, I'm going to end this. If your mama is still alive, you ought to suck it up and you ought to soak it up. Why? Because once your mama is gone, there's a pain that she leaves behind that cannot be filled by anybody. Because she is irreplaceable. And if you don't have your mama and your mama's gone, you ought to find a mama. You ought to find a mama. They are, that's why the Bible said the widow. That's why the Bible said the motherless. You ought to find a woman and you ought to deposit love into that woman because, no, she's not your mama. But listen, folks, you can get a whole lot of mamas. God puts all kind of mamas in your life. Woman down the street, I'm a mama. That's my second mama. That's my third mama. I don't ever hear nobody say that's my first daddy. That's my second daddy and that's my third daddy. Special prayer for my mothers. For my mothers. I want you to stand where you are, but I want a special prayer for my mothers. Can I get my mothers to come down oh, yeah. and, and, and to the altar quickly?
then I want my other women to simply stand in agreement with our prayer. Those who are presently mamas, and then all of my other women, I want you to stand in agreement with our prayer. I remember mama. Mama, if you want to, you can have a seat right there. You can have a seat right there if you want to. You can have a seat if you want to. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to say to you that this modernism, you know, this new thing got, they got going on, that the enemy is using to, to, to distract our mamas, huh? To make them younger and younger and younger and their baby, they're barely out of babyhood themselves. Don't fall for that. Y'all the real deal. And you find a young lady who has who has been bamboozled or whatever, you find her and you mentor her and you bring her into the house of God so that her principles can be godly and she can raise her children up in the admonition of the Lord. If you don't do that, prisons will continue to be filled. If you don't do that, the enemy will still continue to do drive-bys. If you don't do that. So when I see you not coming to church because you're frustrated, and you want to turn in the towel, and you're tired. I'll be wanting to grab you and say, hey, mama, 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 don't. You can't afford. You are the last line of defense. If you fail, I guarantee you, the enemy has open field. And our children will be like, 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 like wayward and defenseless sheep. pray for the women. Bow your heads with me. Father, I pray for every woman who's in the audience. I pray for every, every woman who has a motherly instinct that has been divinely deposited by you. And I just pray, God, that you will touch them and that you will bless them. And God, their time will come if it be your will. And in the meantime, I pray, God, that they will support and pray for those who have mothers, especially single mothers, and unfortunately, in our community, that's becoming so very, very prevalent, so awfully prevalent, so awfully prevalent. It's because there is a, there's an attack on motherhood. So I applaud these women. I applaud them, God, whether they are widowed, whether they are single, I applaud them. And I ask them that you give, ask you that you give them the wisdom that's needed in order to train up their children in the way of the Lord. God, if they fail, then our children are overly exposed and easily exposed to the enemy. So I come against the devil in the name that is above every name. That is the name of Jesus. Give them added strength. Give them an abundance of your grace. Give them the ability, God, to get up one more day and to try it one more time. Yes, they've got those little ones by their side. And no, God, they just can't drop them off anywhere. Yes, it's not really fair, God, but you place them there. Because we've not done, in many cases, what we as men ought to have done. But God, don't fail them, please. Don't fail them. Give them your strength. I pray a covering over them. Added power. Some of our women, God, I'm a, I'm a pastor, and I hear them, and they feel like giving up. Sometimes they feel like giving up with the church. They feel like giving up in the world, and I have counseled many who want to give up their lives. It's, it's, it's sad. But God, bring the joy. Bring the joy. Bring the confidence. Bring the hope. Bring the hope. Bring the hope. Don't let another woman put their children in the car and drive off in the river because she doesn't feel that there's any way out with two or three children. This thing is serious, oh God. This thing is serious. And even women, God, who have been taken advantage of, like, like, like Bathsheba, I pray a special blessing on them. Special blessing. God, when we leave this place, I pray that the Holy Ghost go with us. That is our covering and our line of defense. 
This is my plea and this is my prayer in the wonderful, powerful, loving, merciful name of Jesus. I ask it all. Amen. Give God some praise, somebody. Oh, embrace the woman next to you. Embrace the woman next to you. There's a bond and some camaraderie among the women of God. Going on. Oh, yes, I feel like going on. Yeah, I feel like going on. When trials, oh, when trials. Indulge with me for a moment. Is Sister Sister Lewis here? Mama Lewis and Daddy Lewis? Where are you? Can you come, Mama Lewis? Mama Lewis? She has my same last name. Oh, yes. That might be my second or third mama there, but where where is where is uh short daddy? Uh, uh, I forget what y'all call him, but Cat Daddy? Cat Daddy? Where, where's Cat Daddy? Y'all indulge with me for a minute. This is this Mother's Day, and we, you know, we, a little bit longer today because of the activities and the stuff. Just hold on a second. Come on up, Cat Daddy. Oh, Lord, I feel like I go home. Come on up, Cat Daddy. I feel I love it. I love you, man. I love you. Trials and trials and trials. Will trials come? Oh, every day I feel like we gone. I brought you up because you've just celebrated. I think on Tuesday or Wednesday. Wednesday. How many years you've been married? 42 years. How many children do you have? Three. 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 Has Castro done a good job on your children? I'm sorry, sister. Has Sister Barnett, that's a little secret, they, they don't know about that, done a good job with the children? Big job. Wonderful job. All the job. How long y'all been married? Get it right now, y'all. You're going to be in trouble if you get it right. How long y'all been married? 50. 50 years. 50 years. Come on, cat, cat, cat. How many children do you have? Oh, okay. All right. I think you all want to do something for for your parents. You got something for them? Uh, the microphone right here, right here. Thank you. You all know it's Mother's Day tribute now. Today and tomorrow, our church is going to be full, and they're going to be in church a long time. So y'all just hold on. Should have come expecting Hello. this today. Um, Solomon's Porch family. So um, in light of, in lieu of our parents, 50th wedding anniversary, which was May 3rd. We just want to recognize them. This is our family, and what better place to do it in front of our family. We are so delighted that you all are here with us, and we just want them to know that we do love them, and we appreciate them, and Mother's Day is tomorrow, but I'm just so thankful that I still have my mom here with me, you know, because, again, so many you know, mothers are no longer here, so we love you, Mom, and and Dad. Happy anniversary. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we have um, so my brother Timothy, uh, Timothy, and then my sister 
Deidre. She's here from Panama City. Amen. And our son, Donovan, my sister, Tangela, my sister, Queen, and her daughter, and my son, um, LJ, and Ariel, and Serenity. But we, we, and Austin, and Austin, we just wanted to just say thank you, Mom and Dad. If it were not for you guys, we wouldn't be here. That's but good. we just wanted to acknowledge them in front of our family here at Solomon's Porch and just let them know how much they Amen. love them. Amen. Amen. And he has, you, the Barnetts have a child that's in the, uh, you know, the grands and all that's in England. England. And obviously they were not able to be here today. One of the uh, Lewis family members had a son to get baptized today at another church. And so we, instead of doing this earlier uh, in the service, we had to wait until they got baptized and came from the other church to hurry here so that they can be a part of this. And so we're doing it at the conclusion of our service. Amen. Give them, bless them, bless them, bless them. God bless you. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. And um, afterwards, we have over here, we have cake for them. We have the Welch's champagne for them. So if everybody, you know, at the end can just um, just stay in right. fellowship with us, and we would love it if you guys would do that with us today. I tell you one thing, it better be the kind of wine that Jesus made. <laughs> That's all I know. That's all I know. Amen. Ladies, ladies have, please, please, please have a seat. It, as always, if you don't know Christ as your, as your, as your Savior, your one and only Savior, we invite you to get to know him. He died, he rose, and he lived so that we can live. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, accept him. Today, he will turn your life around. He'll give you a better future. He'll manage your life better than you've managed it so far. And then he'll take you on to glory when he comes. That is our prayer for each and every one of you. And in your heart, if you accept him and just say, I confess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart. And I desire to live for him. May the blood cover me. Then you are justified in his sight. And with that's our prayer for you today. Father, we